Blessings and good evening to each and every one of you in the mighty matchless name of Jesus, Yeshua, our Messiah. And uh, the title of my message, I want to talk to you tonight, as a believing Jew, a uh, born-again, spirit-filled believer in Yeshua, Messiah, I gave my life to our Lord at the age of 17. I won't tell you exactly how old I am now, but let's just say that for uh, uh, nearly four decades, I've been walking with our Lord, and he has been ever faithful and has been a father to me, a best friend, and closer than a brother, as you know. And so what I want to talk to you about is the significance of Passover to the believer. It is called a believer's Passover 2020, and that's why I want to talk to you about. And actually, what's so astounding this year is as we talk in a moment about these plagues, and we have a plague facing the world right now, and many of you are watching from computers and smartphones and television screens under uh, self-quarantine, under self-isolation, under stay-at-home orders by the governor and by the president of the United States of America. And we have an opportunity to actually almost think about what it must have felt like for those early Hebrews trapped in their homes waiting for plague after plague after plague to fall away so that they can once again resume their lives. But they weren't going to resume their lives as they were. They were going to resume their lives in a new spirit of freedom, a new spirit of spiritual renewal and spiritual awakening. So let's get started. Heavenly Father, let's pray. In the blessed name of Yeshua, Jesus, our Messiah, we thank you, we love you, we bless you, we thank you for this opportunity, for the precious word of God. Thank you, Father, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. May faith be instilled in our heart tonight as we hear the scriptures. May our hearts be open to see things and to hear things and to have revealed to us things that we've never seen or heard or understood before in a fresh and a new way, Father. And Lord, we ask all of this in the power and anointing of the Ruach HaKodesh, it's Hebrew for your Holy Spirit, in Yeshua's name, amen. I want to talk to you to start with about a place called Goshen, a place called Goshen. I want to start over in Exodus chapter 8 tonight, verse 22 through verse 23. In verse 22, it says, in, the, in that day, the Lord says, I will set apart the land of Goshen. Now, you see, when Joseph had come into Egypt and had been made second in command after all of his trials and tribulations and the hardships he'd gone through, and Heavenly Father miraculously gave him interpretation of the Pharaoh's dream. The Pharaoh made him second only to himself, and he was able for the seven years of plenty to lay up stores, to lay up enough food, so when the seven years of famine hit Egypt, they did not die. He and uh, his brothers, as you know the story, came and repented for what they had done. Once they found out who he was, they made peace between themselves, and he was able to keep his brothers alive. Heavenly Father had placed him there all of this time for the purpose of keeping the children of Israel alive. <clears throat> and Pharaoh at that time gave Joseph and his descendants and his brothers the land of Goshen within Egypt it was a community, it was an area that was set aside for them to be theirs as long as they lived in Egypt. So the Lord here in verse 22 of Exodus 8, he says, And in that day I will set apart the land of Goshen. In other words, I will take this land where the children of Israel, where the Hebrew children are living, I will set it aside. It will be a special place different from the land of Egypt, even though it's within Egypt. He says, I will set apart the land of Goshen in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there. And you see, this is how it was to be set aside. It was to be set aside 
so that no flies, and from the flies, which is the fourth plague all the way through the tenth plague, were not to touch the land of Goshen, were not to touch the people of God, were not to touch the children of our Heavenly Father. He says, in order that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the land. And so this is what I want to talk to you to start with. And then in verse 23, he says, I will make a difference. Everyone say with me, make a difference. Make a difference. That's right. He says, I will make a difference between my people and your people. Now he's speaking about the Egyptians. I'm going to make a difference between the Egyptian people and my children. And he says, tomorrow this sign shall be. Now, listen to me, saints. The fourth plague that Heavenly Father brought upon the nation of Israel was the first time that he set apart the land of Goshen, the habitations, the homes, the community of the Hebrew children to where their lives were not affected by the plague, only the Egyptians. Now, why do you think it was that plague one, two, and three, and we're going to look at the plagues in a moment, why do you think it was that plagues one through three affected the Hebrew children as well as Egypt, and it wasn't until plague four that there was a difference made between the land of Goshen and the rest of Egypt? I'm going to tell you why in just a moment. God needed, our Heavenly Father needed to get the false Egyptian gods out of the hearts of his people first. First. You see, even though they were slaves in Egypt, many of them had picked up the practice of idol worship and were worshiping some of the same gods or mixing, mixing the paganism of the Egyptian idolatry in with their faith, and their belief in Heavenly Father. And so the Lord allowed them to suffer through the first three plagues so that he would be sanctified in their sight. He would be set apart. They would recognize that the gods of Egypt were not gods at all, but were idols. And there was only one true God. You see, every plague, every plague, it said, that was brought upon the nation of Egypt was brought upon the God, false God, small g, that they worshipped. And yet, they worshipped the Nile. That was their premier God that they worshipped. It was their God of prosperity. And as you know, the very first plague was turning the Nile to blood. That which they worshipped was plagued. Think about this, because this goes into fast forward to where we live here in the year 2020. We're going to talk about that here in a little bit. So Heavenly Father first needed these false idols out of the hearts of his people. So he allowed them to go through the first three plagues. And it was only starting on plague four through ten that our Lord was able to bring a distinction between his people and the Egyptians. You see, saints, in the time that we live in the year 2020, Sometimes believers have to suffer through the same thing the world suffers through so that there can become a pulling away from the idols of repentance from those things in our life that have hindered and hurt. Those things in our life that have been these false foundations, false idols, the gods of gold and silver and of wood and of stone that we've set up in the place of our Heavenly Father the gods of idleness, the gods of entertainment, the gods of distraction. So those things have to be removed first from our hearts. And once those things have been removed from our heart, now there is a distinction between God's people and the unbeliever. So it was only starting on plague 4 through 10 that the Lord was able to make that distinction between his people and the Egyptians. Now, the ten plagues of Egypt, and uh, you can see these here in, on the screen. I'm not going to read through them all, but the first one, of course, was the Nile turning to blood. The fourth one, which is important, was the uh, coming of the swarms of flies. That was important because 
that was the first plague that did not affect the Hebrew children, that did not affect the land of Goshen. And of course, the last plague we're going to talk about in a moment, which was the slaying of the firstborn. The slaying of the firstborn. And that's where we come into the Passover lamb and the blood of the lamb. <coughs> before this plague, there oftentimes, before this COVID coronavirus, COVID-19 plague, there was oftentimes, saints, no distinction between the lives of believers and those of the world. The world looked like the church. The church looked like the world. Heavenly Father, he doesn't just suggest, he commands, commands that there is a distinction between his people and the world. It goes on in Revelation chapter 1 through Revelation chapter 3, where our Lord is giving admonitions to the congregations, admonitions to those congregations about what he expects those congregations to look like and what those congregations needed to repent of. And those admonitions still hold true today. We're to hate even the garment spotted by the flesh. So there has to be a distinction drawn. The things we suffer will cleanse spiritual Egypt from our hearts and allow once again a distinction. So you say, Rabbi Bruce, what is the big deal? I'm a Gentile, I'm a non-Jewish believer. Why is Passover important to me? Because even though we Jews came out of physical Egypt and out of slavery to Pharaoh, as believers, every believer came out of spiritual Egypt, slavery to Satan and sin, and we've been ransomed. We've been purchased. We've been brought out of that life and given a new life. We were slaves to sin, and now we've been set free. We've been set apart. We've been sanctified. We've been called and we've been chosen by the Spirit of God to become his sons and his daughters of the Most High. See, in Exodus chapter 15, we skip now and we fast forward to that last plague, which was the death of the firstborn. Except for those whose homes <clears throat> had had the blood of the Passover lamb placed upon him. We're going to talk about that in a moment. So here in Exodus chapter 12, verse 5 through 7, it's giving us information about this Passover lamb. And it says in verse 5, Your lamb shall be without blemish. What does that mean, without blemish? Perfect spotless. A male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. That's the day that in the Hebrew calendar, now that Passover every year is celebrated. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. We're going to talk about that in a moment. You see, saints, this Passover lamb had to be without blemish. Not a bone could be broken. Isn't it true that our Lord Jesus Yeshua, our Passover lamb, was without sin? Without sin. And he was watched not for three days, but for three years. Never sinned, not once. Perfect, the son of the most high God. And then, as he was upon the cross of crucifixion, on Calvary, Golgotha, as he hung there, they came and they broke the legs of the prisoner on his right. They broke the legs of the prisoner on his left. But they came to Yeshua, Messiah, and he had already died. And they did not break his legs. Why is that important? Because as the Passover lamb, which he was, not a, not a bone could be broken. 
without blemish, without sin. Yeshua, Jesus, is our forever, everybody say forever, forever and ever and ever Passover lamb. For centuries, hundreds of years, every morning at 9 a.m., there would be a shofar call and the morning sacrifice would be offered. Every afternoon at 3 p.m., there would be the clarion call of the shofar and the afternoon sacrifice, the evening sacrifice would be offered. The morning and the evening sacrifices had been offered for hundreds of years. Now, why is that important? At 9 a.m., the scripture tells us, the Lamb of God, Jesus, Yeshua, was crucified. He was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane at 6 a.m., brought to trial, crucified at 9 a.m., the clarion call of the first sacrifice, Yeshua was crucified. And at 3 p.m., the clarion call, at the sounding of the trumpet, at the sounding of the shofar, at 3 p.m., as that second sacrifice was given, the Passover lamb, at that very instant, that very moment, gave up his spirit, gave up the ghost, the scripture says. Wow. What a beautiful picture. Not only is Jesus Yeshua our Passover lamb, but he fulfilled Passover on the exact day of Passover at the exact moment that the Passover lamb was being killed. Our Passover lamb was killed. The blood of the Passover lamb, remember I just read in Exodus how the blood of the Passover lamb was taken and placed, not haphazardly, it wasn't just brushed on a door. No, 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 no. Our Heavenly Father is very specific about the pictures he gives in the Word of God. It was not brushed haphazardly on the doors in Goshen, but rather it specifically says upon the two doorposts and on the lintel of the door. And the basin of the lamb's blood was placed below. I want to show you a picture of this. That's the Passover door. And the blood was placed upon the doorpost, the doorpost, and the lintel. What sign does that make, saints? That makes the sign of the crucifixion of our Lord and shows the blood wounds, his hands, the crown of thorns upon his head, and the basin of blood at his feet. No coincidence, no accident, this is Heavenly Father's picture of the coming sacrifice of his own son for the sins of the world. See, that was the great mystery that our Heavenly Father had given. This incredible mystery that not only would the Jewish people, the Hebrew children of God, be allowed entrance to God and offered salvation, but that God himself loved the entire world, so much so that he gave Jesus, Yeshua, to be a Passover lamb for the entire planet, so that whosoever would confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus, Yeshua, as Messiah, and believe in their heart that the Heavenly Father had raised him from the dead, they'd be saved. You see, the Passover lamb was extended from Israel to all people of every tribe, every tongue, every kindred, every nation. So now, that same blood of Yeshua, our Passover lamb, can be applied to the door of our heart. And then death will pass over us, and we will pass from death unto life by the blood of our Messiah. That's the picture of Passover, saints. This is why believers everywhere need to understand that from Genesis 1-1 all the way to the end of the book of Malachi is Yeshua, Jesus, a picture, a picture, a picture throughout. Same God, 
of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. He says, I am the Lord and I change not. Over in Hebrews, it says Yeshua, Moshiach, Jesus the Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the Lord and he changes not. Now, does this change our doctrine? No, but what it does is it makes the picture so much clearer and it builds our faith and we recognize Heavenly Father had a purpose and had a plan from the very beginning all the way until now. He still has a purpose and he still has a plan. The cross of Messiah had those same blood marks that is now applied to our hearts when we allow his cross and his sacrifice to become so real to us that we surrender our will to his will. These times of isolation in our home should be a time of repentance, a time of seeking Heavenly Father, a time where we recognize and are thankful to the Lord that his blood is upon the doorpost and the lintel of our heart. <coughs> and now there is to be a distinction between the people of God those who are called by his name, those who humble themselves, those who pray and seek his face, and between those who have not yet received salvation that's been offered. Jesus, Yeshua, has exchanged his righteousness for our sin. That's the beautiful exchange of Passover. John 13, 21 says, When Jesus, Yeshua, had said these things, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. <coughs> this was at the Passover Seder. The Passover Seder is the Passover celebration, the remembrance, the memoriam of Heavenly Father's deliverance for the Hebrew children out of Egypt and out of slavery and out of bondage. And he had told his disciples earlier to go and to prepare the Passover. They went to prepare the Passover. They were now sitting in this upper room celebrating the Passover. And suddenly the Holy Spirit had spoken to Jesus, Yeshua, and he was troubled in his spirit. He said, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And then we skip down to verse 26 and verse 27 in the same chapter. And Jesus, Yeshua, answered and says, It is he to whom I will give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. Now, the English translation is bread, but this was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This was Passover Seder. It was actually a piece of unleavened bread. And I can tell you exactly where in the Passover Seder, this remembrance dinner, they were at. They were at the point where the matzah had been taken, and it was dipped into two things. It was dipped into first the horseradish, this bitter herb, and then it was dipped into the quarseth, which is this apple cinnamon sweet mixture. So on this matzah were two things. You had bitterness and sweetness. And as he took this and gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, Judas was faced with a decision. He could choose, he had a choice. That matzah was a picture of the choice of the bitterness of sin or the sweetness of salvation. And as he gave it to Judas, Judas then made an instantaneous decision for bitterness rather than salvation. Because the scripture goes on and it tells us this. In, uh, 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 it says in chapter 24, verse 14, verse 15. Oh, that's Joshua. Well, I'll tell you, I, I didn't have the scripture here. But what it does is it says immediately after Judas took that matzah, it says that he ate it and Satan entered his heart and he went and betrayed the Lord. Why was it at that moment? Because the moment he took that, that choice was between the bitterness or the sweetness of salvation. He chose the bitterness of sin. And once that choice was made, he made that choice. Satan entered into his heart and the deed was done. He just had to walk it down and fulfill it, which he did. And lastly, I want to close with this last scripture. Joshua chapter 24, verse 14, verse 15. He says, Now therefore fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth. 
And put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. You see, even here, Joshua's telling the children of Israel, put away those gods, put away those false idols. You've seen the miracles of God. You've seen the salvation of God. Why would you still turn to these false idols? And we as believers must ask the same thing of our lives. He says, put them aside, put them away, serve the Lord. And then he says in verse 15, and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. When we come out of this self-isolation, one of two things will have happened to many believers. Many will have turned to righteousness. They will come out of their homes different, repentant, humbled before the Lord. Others will have turned from the Lord, choosing the bitterness of sin rather than the sweetness of salvation. And it says in verse 15, and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the, God of the gods of the Amorites, which are no gods at all, in whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, Joshua says, we will serve the Lord. Let that be your heartfelt decision on this Passover Eve. In the precious name of Jesus, Yeshua, our Messiah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, Yeshua, our Messiah, we bless you, we love you. We thank you, Lord, that you are our Passover lamb, that your blood has redeemed us from every tribe, every kindred, every tongue, every people. You've sanctified us and set us apart, Lord. You've made a distinction between your children and the children of this world. Father, I pray that your people will turn from our ways and turn to your ways, that we will humble ourselves, Lord, and pray and seek your face. Then you will hear from heaven and turn from those things which have been unleashed upon this earth. For Lord Jesus, Yeshua, our Messiah, we know that you are returning for a bride not having spot nor wrinkle, a bride who has been awakened by the clarion midnight call, Behold, the bridegroom cometh! And we have lit our lamps, we have prepared ourselves, let this be a time of preparation now in the precious name of Jesus, Yeshua, our Messiah, by the power of your Spirit. And all of God's people said, Amen and Amen. Bless you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Prince of Peace, Jesus, Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen.